Okay, we're continuing now with Pub Battles, Battle of Gettysburg, Part 2. And when we left off, we were at Turn 5, which is kind of late in the afternoon, and that was the positions. So on Turn 5, we've got a new division coming in, Early's Division down the Harrisburg Road here. So uh, we'll put the chits in the um, container, and we'll see who's moving next. Okay, we've drawn the Confederate Third Corps, that's A.P. Hill, which is over here. I'll look at his options, and uh, I suspect he'll probably attack the First Corps. Okay, we've got two divisions, or demi-divisions, of Third Corps Hill attacking Wadsworth and Rowley. Now, this unit happens to be an artillery unit, a Third Corps artillery unit, but he can't get a shot in because friendly units block. Now he is on a hill, partially on a hill, but uh, it's not really a clear shot so the artillery will not be able to add in. So we've got two separate units. Should be fairly equal, although we've got the Union forces on a hill. We've also got a um, an elite unit in Wadsworth, but Wadsworth is um, you know, taking a hit. So uh, again, the all-powerful dice will determine this one. We'll roll the dice and see what happens. Okay, that's the result of the Confederate rolling and the Union. The uh, Confederates didn't do very well. Um, this 5 becomes a 4 because the Union's on a hill, which still counts as a hit, but Wadsworth is an elite unit, and elite units are allowed to absorb the first hit. So. The uh, Confederate attack does nothing. However, the Union did get two hits, so that means Pender here has got to flip. He's spent, and he's going to have to go back uh, retreat. So he'll be go back to here and face that way. So Wadsworth has repulsed the attack. Now we'll go for the second attack. So three dice versus three dice, except um, Rowley is on a hill, so we'll reduce the Confederate die. Okay, the Confederates do a bit better this time. They get two fives, which are reduced to four. That still results in two hits. The Union inflicts one hit on the Confederates. So we'll take the hit on the Confederate, that's Pender. We'll take the hit on Rowley. The second hit on Rowley causes Rowley to retreat. So we'll take our little foot marker here, using the black, turn him around the other way, and oops, and he retreats. Now I don't see anything about advances in this game. I'll check it, but even if you did advance, we'd be talking, what, three-eighths of an inch or so. Well, let me just check that out. No, I don't see anything about uh, advancing, but uh, at this scale, it's not going to make much of a difference, three-eighths of an inch. So we'll draw another chit at the end of that combat. And the next chit is... It's the second core. So the Confederates have got a lot of initiative here. Now, uh, they have at least four units on the board there at the north, so I'll pick up the action after Rhodes uh, and early have moved. Okay, it might be a good idea here to pause a little bit and talk about the rules and the way they're laid out because they are a pain, to tell you the truth. It's because the rules are designed for a gen generic set of rules for all of the other games, the pub battles rules, and then at a certain point you get to the exclusive uh, Gettysburg rules. But um, there's very little in the Gettysburg rules. Historical background, fine. Road columns, how to win the game. Very interesting, it says here, they must get a decisive victory here to win. But they don't tell you what a decisive victory is. Then they go into optional reinforcements, which really should be at the end. Then designer's notes. And then just the setups. So there's uh, nothing about the town of Gettysburg. Yet I recall reading somewhere that you don't want to be getting in the town because you're um, messed up. So that might be in the rules here at the beginning, the pub battles general rules. But 
For a game that doesn't have very many rules, they sure are hard to look up. This is one thing. The rules are all over the place. I can't say I like the rules booklet for that. I'll keep searching here at the beginning to see what the effect of the town of Gettysburg is. Because it doesn't appear to be in the Gettysburg rules itself. Okay, I found the rule, or rather where it is. Uh, it's in the terrain effects. It says here, pieces in buildings become spent and cannot rally. Okay, so that means if you go into Gettysburg, you'll be spent. Now, they must mean they cannot rally while they're in the town. I suspect if they leave the town, they can rally, but um, it's a little vague there. So there's lots of things you have to sort of figure out for yourself. Um, I don't see a definition anywhere for buildings. Now, buildings, I suspect, is just the town of Gettysburg. That's the way I would play it. Because okay, there's a whole mess of buildings here in the town. But these little, they're buildings too, but they're really farms. I would say that you, these do not apply. They must refer to the town of Gettysburg, but it does not say that on the train effects chart. Okay, we've got the second core yet to move. I did move up uh, early. I have to make this decision around Gettysburg. If I go through there, I'm spent, which I don't really feel like doing. So I'm going to see if I can get this uh, division to maneuver around the town. And I think he might be able to make it. Let's see. Okay, so we've got two interesting battles here. I got part of Rhodes' division to go in line uh, around the town. They're going to be hitting Barlow in this open field here. Since they didn't want to go through the town, they skirted the town to the west and they arrived a little bit of an angle at Wadsworth. But that's still uh, not a flanking. So we've got two battles going on. Wadsworth is an elite unit. He's on a hill. And these two units are in the plain. Now Wadsworth has been pretty good. He's been pretty tough since he's an elite unit. But he is spent. Let's catch the action after those two battles. This time rather critical for the area just south of the town. Well, on this first attack, the luck is not with the Confederates. They don't inflict a single hit on the Union, while the Union inflicts two. So Rhodes flips to spent status, and then is forced to retreat, and uh, must face the other way. So he's about here. Just put that leader on top of him for now. So uh, Barlow's division successfully repulsed Rhodes' attack. Now here's an important one. We've got Wadsworth on a hill, and he's an elite, and we've got the other half of Rhodes. So the Confederates need a little bit of luck here to drive the Union off. Let's see what they get. My goodness, luck is still not with the Confederates. This is something I see in a lot of games. Um, anyway, the Confederates don't do a single hit because that four becomes a three because of uh, Wadsworth being in protected terrain and uh, the Union inflicts two hits on Rhodes. So Rhodes' division has been smashed. He flips to show he's spent and he's going to have to retreat and he'll retreat there. He's got to face the other way. So the Union it's got a tough line, and they've repulsed the Confederates on all fronts. We'll draw a chit and see who moves next. Okay, that's Howard's 11th Corps that has moved. Now, for the first time, we could actually think about the 11th Corps counterattacking. And uh, I think this time they will. I mean, if this was competitive, aggressive play, that's probably what I would be doing. Because you've got a spent roads here in clear terrain. You've got a fresh Barlow that's just repulsed him. Why wouldn't you attack? So we'll have Barlow cross this open terrain where Wesley Culp lived. By the way, that's why Culp's Hill is uh, it's named after his family. And uh, Robinson. Hmm. He really could skirt the town too and hit roads. And I think they should do it. They could really hurt the Confederates if they win. Of course, they get bad luck and get repulsed. That's a different story entirely. Scherz is also fresh. He can be used as a support division. 
So I'll move the counters and uh, see what the 11th core can do. Okay, here's a case where the rules, I'm not saying they're bad, but they need a bit of interpretation. Now the rules strictly say you have to maintain your facing while moving. And they say you can move 45 degree angle from where you are. Now if I'm playing strictly by the rules, 45 degree angle, if I moved Robinson in, he would pass through the town, which would mean he was spent. So I just can't just go kablunk and do that, not according to the rules. Now I am allowed to change facing, that I can do, and you lose one third of your movement when you do so. But let's say we had Robinson do so. He changed his facing, and you can see a good portion of his counter is going into the town. So I think if, uh, I hope the intent of the designer was that, that no, Robinson's not in a good position to move up two roads. So roads will not attack. Now Schurz is there. He could certainly support Barlow's attack, but Early's coming up behind. I don't think um, Schurz needs to go forward. So I'm just going to do the one attack. Barlow is attacking Rhodes. Let's see what the result of that is. Wow, Confederates just can't outroll the Union. Just when the Rebs get a good roll, the Union gets a good roll. So this is a complicated one, but it's not good for the Confederates. All right. Okay, because Barlow got two hits on Rhodes and it's already spent, Two hits on a spent piece destroys the unit. So half of Rhodes' division is eliminated. Now the Confederates did get two hits on Barlow. So Barlow's got to be spent. And the second hit causes him to retreat. So we'll turn him around like that. And uh, move him back. So he won the battle, uh, in theory, destroying a unit. But... Uh, wasn't able to hold the ground, although can't kick with that. He's back with his 11th core, though facing the wrong way. Um, I'm not sure if after you retreat can you reface. I'll have to check that. I'll check that right now. No, according to the rules, you don't get a free facing after you retreat. So that's that. Well, there's only one chit left in the game, and that's the first core. So we'll take a look at their options. Now, Wadsworth and Robinson are in very good positions. Rally has fallen back here. They've got a very damaged pender right beside them. So Wadsworth could swing 90 degrees like this and get a flank on Rhodes. I think that's the most logical thing to do. Just turn and flank and hit him in the front with Rowley too. So I think the counterattack by the first core is going to be devastating. Let's uh, do that. Now to do a counterattack, it says the center of the piece must align with the length of the piece. So that's Wadsworth's counterattack. They will be able to add their dice together. So Wadsworth and Raleigh will each roll... Um, gee, was I doing that right? I think spent units have two dice. Let me just check on that. Anyway, uh, that's still an elite unit. But um, he's flanking them, so they're going to be able to add one to the dice. But let me just check that uh, spent unit rule. No, I don't see anything inherently bad about being spent, except cavalry cannot retreat before combat. Okay, so we'll resolve this one. The uh, Union will be rolling uh, six dice, and uh, I don't think there's hills involved here. Well, yeah, the Confederates are on McPherson Ridge, but that's going to be easily negated by the flank. But uh, let's roll by combat. I don't suspect Pender's division is going to be around much longer. Wow, what a gross roll. Lady Luck changes in favor of the Confederates. They get three hits, but the Union gets two. So even when the Confederates are lucky, the Union also get lucky. So I'll take the casualties off these guys, and uh, we'll see what it looks like after. But I think uh, Pender is going to be uh, finished. Yep, as I feared, Pender's division is out. Not good. The Confederates are losing this battle on the first day. Now the Union have to take their two hits, but they can distribute them as they like. So obviously, take the first hit off Rowley, and remember, elite unit Wadsworth 
is allowed to absorb one hit. So that's the end of that fight. The Union have completely smashed the Confederate flank there on McPherson's Ridge. Now, looking at the dead, the Confederates have three pieces destroyed and the Union have one. So the Confederates are not doing very well. And that will end turn five. Okay, back on turn four, I missed the fact that Robert E. Lee arrives on the field. He's over here. But uh, Lee and me don't do much in the game anyway, so Lee's presence isn't going to change this battle. So we're on turn six. Actually, no units come in this turn. We'll be rolling or picking a chit. And uh, who moves first here could be critical. And at this point, I might want to get the baggage trains uh, in play because the baggage trains help you rally men that are damaged. And the Confederates have got a lot of damaged men. And um, I'll explain the baggage trains in a minute. Let's see how the uh, who moves first. So we draw, and it's the uh, second core. What's left of Rhodes and Early. Early is here, and part of Rhodes. So, now there's the Confederate baggage train. Now let me just look up the baggage train rules, and uh, we'll see how the rally works. Okay, the way rallying works is if you take your baggage train, remember it's got a symbol there, and you face it down so that the baggage faces the road, that means that you've dispersed the baggage train and it can be used to give ammunition and rally the troops. So I think that's what I'll do with Yule here. They can actually move the turn they um, unpack, it says here. It says does not cost movement for unpacking. So it could move, unpack immediately, and rally. Okay, so I'll move it up a tad closer here and unpack the train there. Now what that means is units that are within, I think it says a cavalry move. Yeah, if the units are in within one-third of a cavalry move, uh, they can be rallied. So this guy could be, and I might have to move Heath's baggage train up. Because these guys are damaged, we need them to be fresh. So uh, I use the second core move first. So let me look at their options. Okay, Ewell's got to take advantage of Barlow's retreat here. Uh, in this game, you better exploit your wins. So uh, these units are going to be able to reach Barlow and hit him. The question is whether they can get on the flank. Although um, maybe this guy can. All right, so this guy is going to move up like this through open terrain and hit Barlow from the rear. And um, let's see, a change facing is one third of a move. So this guy can get up to here, no problem. And now he's got one third of a move left. So if he changed facing, hmm. No, you won't be able to affect the battle. Because you got to have the guy in your field of fire. It's got to be over half. Well, I'll be content with just moving him on to Benner's Hill here. So we're going to have Early's Division attack Barlow. It's in the plain, open plain. And Barlow is spent. So if there's any kind of half-decent luck for the Confederates, they should do some damage to Barlow. Let's roll the die and see what happens. Yeah, the Union are being flanked in the rear, so they'll have one less pip on each die. And um, here we go. Okay. Well, the bad luck for the Confederates continues. They only get a single hit, because even if they add one for flanking, two becomes three, that's not enough. The Union got some fours, but they're reduced, and um, so they don't do anything to the Confederates. But all that happens there is that Barlow has to retreat. He's not even hurt. Because when a spent unit gets one hit, he simply retreats. So the Rebs are rolling really bad dice. Maybe turn seven and eight, that'll all change. Who knows? Anyway, let's retreat Barlow. Okay, that's after Barlow has retreated. Okay. Now, oh, that's right. I flipped him. So this guy will qualify for rallying. So Rhodes can rally, so we'll just put him back. 
because he was within rally range and the baggage train was there. So now we're drawing another chit and it's the good old 11th core. Let's see what they can do. Okay, well that's an easy one because the 11th core has got to spin around for sure. Now where's their baggage train? Oh, that's right. It's this first core baggage train here. It's very close to the, the Confederates. We don't want that. Anyway, Barlow will certainly face, turn around. So he's on Culp's Hill, which would be a nice defensive position. Schurz is still fresh here. He's doing fine. Um, and that's probably it for the 11th Corps. Now we've got Steinway here coming up the Emmitsburg Road. So he could uh, maybe support Schurz. Yeah, we haven't seen supporting units yet, but uh, I think that's what he'll do. Uh, Steinwehr will change his face, uh, no, yeah, he'll change his facing. And that costs him one-third of the uh, foot movement. So he can go up, yeah, and easily support Schurz. When you support somebody, you go directly behind them. And that's the 11th Corps move. Let's pull some chips, see who's moving next. And the winner is the first Corps, which is probably good because, uh, I think the first core baggage train um, better get out of dodge there. So let's move the first core. And uh, hmm, they could actually attack this Confederate unit. But let's uh, look at the first core options. But let's get this baggage train out of there first. I don't like the look of the Union line there um, for the first core. Um, I think I'd rather just get it back into a line. And uh, that's what I'll do. They're in a little bit of a disarray. Disar they won that battle, but I don't really feel like trying to go after a fresh Confederate unit here, even with these two spent ones. Um, the Union are winning, so why throw away the game? So I'll just realign the first core, and I'll show you what happens after they've realigned. Okay, that's the situation after the first core is realigned. You can see they're all in a row, covering the Emmitsburg Road. 11th Corps on Cemetery Hill, Barlow's anchoring Culp's Hill, much like the real position. That's still turn 6, so there's only one chit left, and that chit is the 3rd Corps, which is uh, AP Hill. So I think he's just going to have to organize, and we'll catch the action after we've moved AP Hill. Okay, this is after the 3rd Corps has moved. That's the baggage train here, which I have faced down. So it can rally units that are within the command range of it. So Heath here will rally because they're pretty knocked up, these Confederates. And uh, Pender will rally, so they're fresh. When you rally, though, you can't move. There's Robert E. Lee there, and there's uh, Hill. So that ends turn six. Let's take an overview. Okay, that's the situation at the end of turn six. Now there'll be a turn seven. And then, uh, I guess turn 8 is night. Well, it doesn't specifically say that. No, turn 8 does not say night. I'll have to look up the rules again. This is where, again, they're not very clear. It doesn't say night on the um, order of appearance chart. So there's probably two turns left of daylight. Going pretty well the way the battle went. Except the Confederates are taking far more uh, casualties than the Union. Union still has a good position here, and um, they can replenish. We'll have to get the uh, first core wagon here closer to the first core so they can replenish. But uh, that's the end of turn six. We'll go to turn seven. Some new men come in, I think. Yes, they do. And we'll catch the action. Okay, it's going to be turn seven. We've got some new units arriving. Bernie is a division from the third core, so we've added that shit to the mix and Williams and Geary from the 12th Corps down here on the Baltimore Pike. So they'll be coming in. And uh, some Confederate reinforcements, Johnson's Division and Anderson down here at Chambersburg. Chambersburg Pike. So, we'll see who moves first and take it from there. Okay, we've drawn the 2nd Corps chit. That's Ewell's Corps. Uh, not looking too good. He's a bit scattered and boy that Union line looks tough. 
I think I'll go sit over on the Union, the Confederate side of the table, take a look at it from their point of view, see what my options are. Well, we could assault Culp's Hill, I think. Probably could get a, a supported attack. We haven't seen those yet. So that's what I'll do. If I can get these two divisions in place, we'll have them attack uh, Barlow on Culp's Hill, who happens to be uh, uh, spent. So. And maybe if we get a little bit of luck this time, maybe the Confederates can do something. Okay, I had intended to have those two brigades or divisions, demi divisions, attack Culp's Hill, but I realized I could not do that. Remember, because your core leaders have to be within range, and Yule is way off to the back here. So I'll move Yule up, but I couldn't have done that attack this turn. So I'll just back these guys up to something like that. Benner's Hill, they won't attack. And that's the second corps move. Oh, I'll have to redo, well, not, not redo, but add to that move. I forgot that uh, Johnson is part of the second corps of Ewell. So Johnson will move, and the next uh, chit that I happened to pick was the third. So I'll move Johnson up and uh, take a look at uh, AP Hill's options. Okay, Johnson's division had one heck of a messy move. So I got to use those um, blank counters here to show that he's on a secondary road now and strung out. Because I want to have him go up the Chambersburg Pike, get out of the Mimsburg Road, and get in over into this area. So he's using the road. Uh, because Heath's core, Heath's uh, division is in the way. He can't go through enemy units or friendly units on road column. So we've got a bit of a traffic jam there which uh, happened historically, by the way. Johnson got uh, caught behind Longstreet's wagons and was, didn't get to the battlefield till the uh, early evening. So uh, the game is reflecting history. Now we've got um, Hill's third corps to move. Let's see what his options are. Okay, Hill's pretty shot up. He's only got two good infantry units and an artillery. And uh, the way he's been rolling, I don't think he wants to go against this Union line. I think what he'll be content to do is maybe take a line up here in Seminary Ridge and be content with that. So that's what he'll do. He just doesn't have the strength to bother the Union line now. He'd have to wait for Anderson's division, which is coming up here. Now also there's a rule that if you lose 50% of a, of, a, of a formation, the units can't rally. That doesn't mean by division, it's by the core. So uh, you've got to watch your casualties. You reach a certain point, you're not going to be able to rally your men. So I'll move Hill up, and that'll end his uh, turn. Okay, that's after Hill has moved. He's just moved up here in Seminary Ridge and parts of uh, McPherson's. Okay, we'll draw another chit. We'll see who's moving next. That happens to be the 12th Corps. That's a fresh Corps coming on uh, from the Baltimore Pike here. And. Uh, He'll probably scoot up that road. Okay, that's after Slocum has moved. He's in road column. That's a major road, so he does have that long strung out thing. And he's up behind Wolf Hill here. And uh, he's going to shore up the Union line nicely. Let's pick the next chit. Okay, the next chit is Sickles' Third Corps. Right now he's arriving personally with Bernie's division. That's the Tiny Town Road. So if he uses road column, he will have a long skinny column behind him. But uh, we'll catch the action after he's moved. Okay, that's after Sickles has moved. Bernie's division, rather. Sickles in command. And uh, he's got this baggage. Well, not, it's not the baggage train, but it's an empty block. Because he's, he's using a secondary road going up the road. He's got a long, long column behind him. So uh, the Union is concentrating fast now faster than the Confederates, I think, and uh, doesn't look good for the Confederates on July 1st. Okay, the next chit is the First Corps, so I think what they have to do is get their baggage train moving here, and then um, spread out behind the First Corps so they can rally these guys. So, there's no problem there. We'll get them within range. Let's see. Can move them right up to Cemetery Hill here. Yeah. Well, you lose a bit of movement when you when you face. So, when you turn 45 degrees, you lose two thirds or one third. So, 
they'll be up here. That'll be the baggage train of the first core. And that should be within range of Rally. Not quite for him. So I might have to tighten up the first core line. I don't want to do that. I don't want to pull Rally out of position. Um, no, don't want to do that. But I will rally Wadsworth because it's an elite division, so he can rally now because he won't move. So uh, the Union Army is getting stronger now, stronger and stronger. The last chit is the Eleventh Corps, and um, wow, they're going to get a nice little bonus. Because they're within range of the baggage train, oh, I'll have to put the baggage train face down, they're going to be able to rally. So they're going to be fresh on Culp's Hill. Now, I would say the Union position now is very, very good. I don't see how the Confederates are going to make any headway on July 1st now. But uh, that ends the turn. We'll go to turn 8, see what happens. Okay, that's the situation as we begin turn 8. We've added a new chit in there, Longstreet's 1st Corps. Hood and McClaws actually arrive kind of at night behind the Gettysburg lines. And I'll almost be able to call the game pretty soon. But I'll at least finish uh, turn 8, which is the last uh, daylight turn, I believe. And then night. Or is it turn 8 a night turn? I'll have to check the rules. It's not really clear. Okay, checking the rules, there's nothing about turn 8 being a night turn. Now by implication, I guess uh, turn 8 is listed here and then a night turn. So um, night must come after turn 8. Okay, so turn 8 will be the last daylight turn and uh, let's see what happens. I think what's mainly going to happen is just people are coming up. Uh, it would be the last turn that people can attack and the Confederates aren't very <laughs> Very good position to attack. Let's see what happens. Okay, the chit pulled is Ewell's second corps. Now, he's only got two divisions um, that could attack. They could make one last desperate lunge at Culp's Hill. Many historians think they should have, but the situation here is so bad, I'm just not sure if it's worth it. Uh, I suppose I should try. Johnson's division is straggled all over the place. Anderson, uh, actually I should have brought Anderson on, but it makes no difference. He'd be in the rear here anyway. And Hood and McClaws will come on. But they'll be whining all through these roads here. I don't think they're going to make any difference to the July 1st battle. So the July 1st battle is virtually over. But um, I just have to decide on early. Okay, looking at the situation, if, I've, if these two brigades or two divisions, demi-divisions, attacked Culp's Hill, they would be at the base of the hill. They would have a disadvantage. Yes, they have two units, but they can't really bring two units to the bear. I can, I can only use one as a support unit. So the chances of taking hill, uh, Culp's Hill are not very good. And uh, they, the way this game works, you really can't take the hill. You know, you uh, hit the guy, and uh, if you drive them off, there's no advance after combat. So there, there's much chance of taking Culp's Hill. I think Lee has got to wait till July 2nd. So I think with that, I'll call the game. Because what's going to happen in turn 8 and turn 9 is units are going to flood onto the board. The Union will consolidate their position here. The 12th Corps obviously will come up to Culp's Hill, maybe extend down to here, Wolf Hill. And, of course, they've got Sickles here who can easily extend the Union left. So, much like the real battle, the Confederates have just run out of time. But if you were playing this just as a one-day scenario, here's your casualties. Now, I think the way they work out the casualties is three points per infantry division. Let me just check, check it out. Yeah, the rules say that a destroyed infantry piece is worth uh, three points. And... Uh, Buford is called a Dragoon in this game. He's worth four. So the Confederates have scored four points and the Union has uh, scored nine. 
So that's a two to one advantage. And it's supposed to go the other way. The Confederates should be ahead in points, which they are not. So let's do a summation of this game. Okay, summation. Pub battles. Do I like it? Yes, I do. I think the game is a lot of fun. A lot of fun. It's a simple game. And the simpler games have a lot of luck. You can see that it was very luck based. The Confederates didn't have a lot of good luck in this one. You just have to live that, uh, live with that with simpler games. But it's not a bad recreation of the Battle of Gettysburg. I like the uh, wooden counters. I like the free movement. I like the fact that you're not having to fight for certain terrain. Although in this game I followed the uh, Union plan. And um, I think playing this with an opponent with uh, the reserve rules and uh, the baggage trains and stuff like that would be uh, a very rewarding experience. It makes me wonder what some of the other games are like in the series. They have several Napoleonic games. They also have a, one on the little bighorn battle. So um, how does this compare to other Gettysburg games? Well, that's a very difficult question because as I said in uh, my other videos, you know, there's 82 games published on the Battle of Gettysburg. And, you know, you, you can't always be playing Last Chance for Victory. So you can't compare this game to, let's say, Last Chance for Victory. It's just apples and oranges. This is a game with thousands of pieces. It'll take you 100 hours to play the whole battle. You just can't compare it to pub battles. But, why do I like it? Well, for a simple game, it's got a respect for history. And, um... I think that's why I like it. Would I buy more in the series? I don't know. Don't, I, I don't think so. Um, I think there's only so far this system can be carried. Uh, and they are expensive games. There's no question about that. When you compare that to a game like Last Chance for Victory or with let's say something like Virgin Queen, uh, you're getting a lot of bang for your buck in those boxes. So each person will have to evaluate themselves whether uh, it's worth it to get one of them. But if you do, uh, it is a lot of fun, no question. Rules, mm, they need some polishing. The idea of having the musket rules in the first part of the rules, and then Gettysburg, there's almost no exclusive rules for Gettysburg at all, like a page and a half, the rest is charts. Uh, that's a little bit rough. I'm sure the other games in the series are probably similar. So, um, my only caveat would be that um, veteran players, I think, would like it as a nice, a nice light game. Teaching a brand new player, I think they might like it too, but uh, uh, you'd need a veteran teaching a rookie. I think if two rookies got this game and were playing it for the first time, they might have a bit of difficulty interpreting some of the rules, like just some of the procedures, where they say that... Um, you know, you expend a leader and then he's refreshed, but he doesn't tell you what to do. Well, there's little in-house rules you can do. Okay, there he, he's not expended and put the flag up and he's expended. But these are not explained explicitly in the rules. But overall, yeah, pub battles Gettysburg. I do like it. And uh, if you're into the Battle of Gettysburg and want something light, something you might want to consider. And uh, the pieces, the map, it's beautiful. You may like it. So that's it for Pub Battles, and uh, thank you for watching.